Good afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear? Um, yes. Okay, that's great. Okay, um, without wasting much time, I will get started. Um, today, we're going to be looking at 3D printing, reality capture, and VR, like um, Gunzis has just said. Um, I just want to explain why this talk is titled Alt Plus BIM. Um, partly because it seemed like a catchy way to name the talk, but also I'm not going to be describing these tools in the context of BIM that is sort of commonplace in our minds. When a lot of us hear BIM, I'm sure the first thing we think about is Revit, schedules, work sharing, and basically um, the kind of office work that we must all do. I'm sure most of us are in the AAC industry, architecture, engineering, or construction. So our idea of BIM um, may or may not fit into all of the contents of the talk. So the alt there is just like an alternative um, way or an alternative approach to talking about BIM or looking at BIM. Um, let me introduce myself before I get carried away. Yeah, so my name is Victoria Ikede. That's my face right there. Um, I'm Nigerian. I did my undergraduate studies at the University of Nigeria, and I did my master's in architectural design at the Sheffield School of Architecture. That's the University of Sheffield in England. Um, I've been an architect since 2013, basically since I finished my undergraduate studies in 2012. And I went for my master's education in 2016. Um, after I completed my course, I started working at the university as a TA, a teaching assistant. And one of the, in fact, not one of the main my main duty was to teach people how to use virtual reality tools. So um, that's kind of where my dive into this BIM and technical world sort of started. Um, after that, I became a BIM manager at ATO. I've been doing that since 2018. And I'm also um, ISO 9001 2015 quality management representative. Um, I know a lot of us who are BIM enthusiasts have probably heard of ISO 19650, which is the international standard for BIM. Um, 9001 2015 is a standard for quality management. So I do that along with managing our BIM processes. They sometimes overlap, sometimes they don't, but um, more often than not, I find myself sort of on the balance between both of them. The pictures below are just highlights of some of the work I've done. Um, and then you can sort of see my technical skills if you um, want to have an idea of what I'm able to work with and so on. So um, without wasting much time, I'm going to get right into the talk for today. The structure of the talk is I'm going to introduce the basic concepts behind 3D printing, reality capture, and virtual reality. And then I'm going to talk about tools and techniques, and then highlight some of my projects, and then um, talk about some innovative ways that people have used these methods in our industry. Um, I would advise that if you have any questions as I go along, that you sort of write them down in the chat box or on a piece of paper somewhere, because I am going to go um, sequentially. So I'm going to talk about one, then talk about another, and talk about another. And if you wait till the end, you may not remember the first thing I said. So if you have any questions as I go along, I'd advise you just write them down. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, first and foremost, it's all about stretching the imagination. Um, I know a lot of the time, BIM and the way we work, we are sort of focused on the tools we use and the technology. 
but I want to take you back a bit to the beginning and emphasize on how imagination is sort of the driving force behind most of these tools that we use. Um, design, drawings, and illustrations are the mediums with which we get our ideas into the world. With, beyond these tools, we are unable to get other people to see what we have in our mind's eye. Designers are by nature kind of self-centered and we're always thinking, how much of my imagination can I bring into the world? And because it's not yet possible for people to see the images in your brain, you need a tool or a medium to explain to them in very clear terms how they can help you bring this vision you have to life. And this goes back to like from the very beginning, we had like cave drawings um, as early as like the early men, because this was their own way of capturing the images they saw around them. And then these images kept evolving in complexity. You had things like the Egyptian hieroglyphs that were a bit more um, mathematical or a bit more calculating in the way they represented images. So the, the degree of complexity of both imagination and expression were evolving over time. And this was sort of represented in the way we started to express ourselves, primarily through drawings. Um, and then you have a structure like the Stonehenge, which was built in the Neolithic era. I hope I got that right. Um, you have a series of monoliths gathered around in a circle, which seems simple enough. But I'm pretty sure that someone had the idea for it and someone had to convince a bunch of people that we need to get these stones in a geometrical circle. And I don't want to even imagine how long it must have taken for them to get the perfect radar of the circle and how many drawings or parchments it must have taken or stones or whatever the medium was at the time. But at the end of the day, it started in the mind, it started as an imagination and these tools are ways of bringing that imagination to light. Then, because man being who man is, um, we are the ones with the imagination, at least to our understanding. We started to see spaces as designed for our use. And so we started to look at how to design spaces for man. And you have images like the um, Vitruvian man and the modular man that are diagrams illustrating how spaces can better serve us as the primary user. And then our illustrations and diagrams started to evolve in complexity where we have more and more complex drawings. And then even at some point deviated almost into looking like art or photography, which probably at the time of production was controversial because perhaps at the time they did not understand the imagination of the artist or the architect. But as we can see today, even the craziest looking forms, which a few decades or a few maybe centuries ago would have seemed impossible, have now been built. And that's because the tools of communication and expression of that imagination have also increased in complexity. This is a building that was done as early as 1852, was pr presented primarily by drawings. and. I highlighted this building because I wanted to demonstrate that it wasn't as though the tools we have today are the reasons why we're able to do complexity alone. Like the imagination, the ideas have always been there. Um, even this building, to be very honest, a lot of the parts were a bit too complicated to produce at the time that it was designed and technology has sort of caught up to it and now they are completing it at a much faster pace. So. Um, most of the time, the struggles we have as creative humans that we are is that we are not able to represent what we have in our mind's eye. And that's why tools keep developing. That's why software developers keep trying to push things out there to help people to bring out the things they have in their mind's eye. Um, this is another example of a, an early building that was done. And you can see people on the right in an office, a typical maybe architectural practice in those days, people would probably have to stay over at the office for hours just trying to get this thing, which in the mind is already probably fully complete because everyone has an idea 
of what it would be like, or even if it isn't, um, by drawing and by bringing out what's already in the mind's eye on paper, they are able to now resolve the conflict and the spatial relationships and everything that will make it a building that would be habitable. Um, this particular building is called Park Hill. It's very similar to the 1004 essay we have in Lagos, incidentally. Um, even though this was designed to be low cost housing, um, 1004 is more of a luxury thing these days, but um, this kind of design at that time was designed for social housing and was designed um, basically to accommodate the sort of poor and lower middle class in society. Unfortunately, when you have that many low income earning families in one place, it becomes a crime zone. And that's actually what happened here in Park Hill. And as for anyone who has read about social housing, you know that the experiment sort of failed and most of them were shut down. But this particular one is being um, renewed for use now. That's the present day image of the building. It's now a mixed use building. But you can sort of see that even though the conception and the idea behind this building was several decades ago. Even now, because of that linking of thought to what the original idea was, the original imagination of the architect was, people are still able to add to it to keep expanding and pushing the boundaries of what the space can be used for. So um, I just wanted to get that point across that it's not it's not really about the technology and the tools. It's about the ideas and how these tools are helping us to communicate them to people so that it's easier to build. I'm sure we can remember the story of the Tower of Babel and like in the Bible where um, a bunch of people were building a tower that would touch heaven and they were struck with confusion and they couldn't complete it. Um, a lot of people get different lessons from that story, but it just goes to show that without communication, you can't build anything because people need to work together as a team to realize any kind of building. So I'm going to bring it back to the topic for today, which is um, now verifying that imagination. So you have something in your mind's eye and you've stretched it, you've thought about different ways to express it. And now you need to give this to someone else who needs to verify that what you have imagined isn't crazy, essentially. Like, I need to know that I can live in the space you've imagined. Um, this is still a controversial thing till today, to be honest. A lot of people design spaces for themselves and not for the users, but that's a whole other green talk on its own. Um, so these tools are for verifying the imagination. And like I said earlier, um, earlier forms of, of using, earlier forms of expressing imagination were through drawing and model making. So you could make models with paper, with wood, with different tools. Not to say that model making is now extinct, but um, these were like the main methods you had to express and communicate your ideas at a time. And then the Lego came in at some point, um, which, even though it was mainly a children's toy. Um, I know a lot of architects that credit their love and passion for design to Legos because there's something about having uh, something so basic and functional that allows you to express your imagination even as a child that inspires you to keep creating. Um, so we went a little further from that and delved into something called stereoscopy. Sorry. I always have a tongue twister whenever I pronounce that. Stereoscopy, yes. So a stereoscope is an optical instrument and stereoscopy is the production of the illusion of depth in a photograph, movie, or any other two-dimensional image by the presentation of a slightly different image to each eye. The two images are then combined in your brain to give you the perception of depth. So this was the the, the thing before VR became a thing, um, you would have two images that were photographed in such a way that when you used the stereoscope to look at them, your mind would sort of converge the two images and you get an illusion of depth as to what you are looking at. And it is this concept that was further developed into the virtual reality that we have today. And then we also had stereolithography, which was also what came 
before 3D printing. Um, I will talk about 3D printing shortly, but stereolithography um, is, is kind of a reverse of how today's 3D printing works. Um, it works by using a high power laser to harden a liquid resin that is contained in a reservoir to create the desired 3D shape. So um, that vat of polymer liquid is sort of hit with a beam of laser and it hardens to take the shape of whatever was fed into it. And then you bring it out, as you can see in the image, and let it cool and your model is formed. But I'm guessing there are limitations to this as well. Um, and that's why it was developed into 3D printing that we know today. And then we had wide angle photography, which was also a way to get several images together, overlap them and give you a more sort of complete view of what of a space. Unlike regular photographs that were just basically limited to the range of the lens you were using, wide angle photography was a way for us to see a wider view of the spaces that we were experiencing. So these were like the preliminary concepts that evolved to what I'm going to be talking about today. And I just felt it would be important to highlight them a bit. So without further ado, I'm going to dive right into um, talking about where, why we're here today. We are 3D printing and reality capture. This is where we are for now. And as we all know with technology, whatever we have already is already old. It's already like past tense. Um, we don't know, or maybe some people may have an idea, but whatever is coming next will not be these. These have been um, sort of um, perfected to a good extent. There's still some issues here and there, but um, knowing the human mind will be thinking of the next thing. So um, they're new and innovative today, but they're already sort of the norm. And we'll be looking at the future in a couple of years. Um, this image illustrates sort of how those three mediums I've just described fit into our typical building process. So in the past, we used to have drawings, then you make a model, then you have a house. But now you have um, your drawing in a computer or a model. Sorry, I know as a BIM manager, I shouldn't ever use the word drawing, to be honest. But um, we have a model in a computer that becomes a 3D print, which is, which is replacing the paper models of the past or you could get your user to enter into that model or rather to just visually experience that model in three dimension using VR. And then if you're okay with it, your client, your user is okay with it, you end up with a product. But thanks to reality capture, that's no longer even the end. You can now take that final product again and feed it back into the system and sort of repeat the whole process until everyone is satisfied. And an extra dimension, which is beyond the scope of this talk, but is important to mention, is augmented reality, where you don't even necessarily need to go back and do more work on your BIM model as such, or, or basically like edit the building as such. You can create visions of what you would like super, superimposed on the building and experience that using augmented reality before you commit any money to making any changes. So this is just an illustration of how they fit into the BIM process. The first thing I'm going to talk about is reality capture. On the left side of the image is a um, photogrammetry model I did for House on the Rock Lecky, um, the Rock Cathedral. I don't know if any of us have been there, um, but this was done using drone imagery, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, there are basically four categories of reality capture for now. Um, there's a photo-based one, which basically works with a principle called photogrammetry, which I will explain shortly. And photo-based reality captures are done using drones and even handheld mobile phone cameras. You can use any sort of image capturing device to do photogrammetry. It doesn't need to be very complicated or very um, technical in, in that way. 
um, there's LIDAR, which is usually done with um, airplanes or sorry, helicopters in the past is done from the sky because LIDAR is essentially um, measuring depth using a laser beam shooting from the sky down and measuring um, the, the distance between the points and using that to sort of create a point cloud. But thanks to or manned area vehicle, vehicles, which are drones, we now also have drones that have the capacity to do LIDAR scanning. Um, we have handheld 3D scanners, which are typically connected directly to a computer and you sort of hold them around the subject. So it could be a person or an object and you hold the scanner and go around that subject and get a 3D scan. The advantages to the handheld scanner is that it sort of gives you a real-time feedback of what you're scanning. I've used one of them before. And what's interesting about it is that the computer sort of gives you an idea of what you've scanned as you are scanning. Um, and so you don't miss out any points on your subject. Or like some of the other ones which require you to sort of take a bunch of pictures and then go and do some processing. Then after doing processing, you find out that maybe you missed out on some bits, which is more of a planning problem, to be honest. Um, handheld scanners sort of just give you real time feedback. But because they are basically has to be connected to the computer, it's also limiting in how far you can take it or how much scanning you can do with it. So I think the drones are typically the most used equipment for um, photogrammetry and reality capture. And finally, we have laser scanners. Um, these are more precise than any of the ones I've mentioned before, maybe except for the LIDAR. Um, laser scanners use a principle of light reflecting of a rotating mirror. And as the light hits the mirror, a point in time, a point in space, sorry, is captured and several points form a cluster, which is called a point cloud. And that point cloud becomes the model which you as the architect or engineer can work with. Um, because I'm not going too much in depth, I have a lot to talk about in today's talk. I would advise that if you're interested in reality capture in like deep te technicalities, you go and look at the last BIM talk as built as if, which was done just before this one. Um, the speaker covered reality capture in detail. So if you're interested in more about this, I think you can check that out. So um, I am personally familiar with photogrammetry as a method. I haven't really used laser scanning or lighter capture or any of the other ones, basically because the equipment is quite expensive and um, it requires a huge investment. It's not something I think a hobbyist can afford per se. Um, but the concepts of photogrammetry is easy to achieve, like I said, with any image capturing device. And it basically works with the idea of overlapping images together. So in the image, you can see the horse from two angles. And by finding points at which the images intersect, the computer is able to interpret that and merge that into a point cloud model or a mesh model as the case may be which you can now work with in your 3d software like revit or, or um, recap or any of the other ones that accept point clouds um, a key thing for photogrammetry is taking lots and lots of images from as many angles as possible um, because the software works by linking random points um, in images, it, it sort of does a sampling where it can identify what matches what. The more images you have, the more precise the model you have will end up being. Um, there are limitations depending on the software you're using. Some software have um, the maximum number of images you can use. So you probably shouldn't exceed the maximum number you're allowed to use. But as much as possible, more images equals um, more realistic model. So going back to the House on the Rock project, um, I'll go back to that in a bit. We took lots and lots and lots and lots of pictures. We took like, 
I think at a point I even had to extract images from a video file we did with a drone. And we took all of that into Autodesk Recap. And basically it helped us to select the images that worked, told us that some didn't work, and we're able to do some more refining and selecting. And then we ended up with a point cloud model, which we used in Revit. So this is the point cloud model in Revit. And you can see that it is actually three dimensional. It's a side by side comparison with the Revit model. And um, this was sort of doing error checking. For this project, the client wanted as view drawings or an as view model um, for their use. So we could actually compare with the measurements we did our, ourselves on site, just as a tool for verification. We also did some hand-based measurements and it was, I would say, completely precise. Even the levels and everything were very little margin of error at the end of the day. So I would imagine how much time it would have taken for us to have done these measurements without the use of photogrammetry. Probably would have taken us a couple of weeks. But we did this in maybe an hour, took a bunch of pictures and stitched them. And voila, we had a 3D model. Um, so I'm just going to play a video showing how the model can be interrogated using Autodesk Recap. So you can do um, color codes to get the elevation. You can isolate sections. And you can take off measurements. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's just basically that project. Some common uses of reality capture are for surveys, like I've discussed, and also historical and cultural preservation. Um, because it's easy to get three-dimensional models using reality capture, a lot of people are now using it for um, registered and listed buildings in case there's any damage in future. They have a model to refer to. And also projection mapping. So projection mapping is a cool way that artists are um, using projectors on buildings to sort of play with the dimensions of the buildings. It looks as though the building is coming alive with the play of lights and everything. And reality capture sort of helps you um, to get the building into the software that does that for you. So very quickly, I run past the software that you can use for reality capture. Um, the two that I have used personally are Agisoft PhotoScan and Autodesk Recap. Those are, I think, the, the two most accessible ones, even though they're not free as, as such, but they're more accessible than some of the more complex ones you would find. Um, and those are the tools that I use for reality capture. So I'm going to move right into 3D printing. Like I said, if you have any questions, please um, save them for the end of the talk. Um, before I dive right into 3D printing, I just want to highlight that it is a method of additive manufacturing. So um, manufacturing used to be left to the big workshops, the big industries, and now they're becoming more accessible. You can have them in your homes and in your office. And the two main types that are in this sort of small scale are additive or subtractive. Additive manufacturing is a process that adds successive layers of material to create an object. But um, subtractive manufacturing involves removing sections of material by machining it or cutting it away. So for, subtract, sorry, for subtractive manufacturing, you have CNC machines where you, have, you could have like a big mass of metal or glass or whatever, and a drill goes into it to mill out the shape of what you want to produce. And then you have laser cutters, which are more precise, but also um, generate heat from the laser. So depending on what you're trying to do, um, you sort of have to think about what is most ideal for what you are trying to produce. So 
3D printers, um, these are the main parts of 3D printers. They are best for um, forms that are self-supporting. Um, I will explain how the 3D printer moves in a bit so that that is clearer. Um, if you have forms that have very tiny details or forms that have cantilevers, I would not advise using a 3D printer or I would not advise um, printing directly without editing your design because the 3D printer, because of the additive nature of it, is not able to basically print on the air, which is what a cantilever would be. Um, if you look at the image on the right, you can see that the printer sort of moves in an X, Y axis, and it does this while going up in Z axis. So as the printer works, the bed keeps going down and the nozzle keeps going up, the hot end keeps going up. And um, if you have a shape that is not supported properly, you would have failure in that part. Um, it, it just can't support itself. It's standing in an open air kind of space, so it wouldn't work. Um, there are basically two main kinds of printers. Um, there are several brands of printers, but there are basically two types of printers. There are printers that have heated print beds and heaters that don't need heated print beds. The print bed being heated or non-heated also affects the kind of filament that would be used. There are PLA filaments, which are typically what are used for printers that don't require heating. And then there are ABS filaments, which are used for printers that require heating of the bed. Um, essentially, to summarize, when you want to do a 3D print, you have a model, maybe in Revit or SketchUp or wherever, you export it to STL. All 3D printers sort of start from STL. They each come with their own proprietary software that would convert your STL file to a file format that the printer understands. So that could be G-code or X3G or whatever it may be. But um, typically, if you can find a way to convert your model to STL, you can print it. And you send it to a memory card which is slotted into the printer. You adjust your temperature settings and speed settings on the print display. And then um, depending on the print temperature you've set, the filament, which is typically solid, is melted. And as the hot end from the nozzle moves, it sort of draws out your shape. Think of it as though you were drawing layers of something on tracing paper and just lay stacking them on top of each other. And that is how a 3D print is formed. Um, popular software, depending on the printer you use, is Mesh Mixer, Cura. So basically, there are different colors of filaments for 3D printing and different types of 3D printers that can be used. There is even a, oh, it's telling me my connection isn't very good. Um, there is a 3D printing pen, which is relatively new, where you can actually draw in 3D space and it solidifies and becomes an object. Um, I personally use the RF100, which is on the bottom left, is one of the less robust 3D printers. I think the Ultimaker is one of the more popular ones. It's probably one of the best I've seen um, people use. So um, if you're interested in purchasing a 3D printer, I advise that you do some serious research because a lot of the time you are restricted to the size of the print bed. Um, the RF100 print bed is as small as 15 centimeters. So you're usually not able to get prints easily done when you want something bigger than 15 centimeters. Um, so I'd advise doing some research on the print bed and the sizes before you purchase one. Um, so these are some of the prints that I've done. As you can see, there's some threading, almost like little heads coming out of the, the model. As I was saying, these are the prints I've done. Um, you can go the extra mile like I was trying to do here by putting lights in your print, make it more beautiful, sell it as a model to a client or 
depending on what you want to do with it. Um, you can see um, the images on the top left, how the printer is adding layers upon layers on the building. And one thing to note, um, especially with architectural models, is the amount of work that goes into preparing it for 3D printing is a lot. You can imagine shrinking down a life-size building into a very small model, something that would be realistic, like having a 300 mm wall, which can stand in real life. By the time you shrink it to that scale, it kind of disappears. So I always have to thicken the walls by like doubling them, um, thicken all the columns, remove any tiny detail because it will not print out properly. So these buildings you're seeing probably have the smallest wall as 600 mm thick and the smallest column as maybe as much as 600 to 900 mm thick. So there's a lot of work that goes into it. To be very honest, I don't think 3D printers were designed for architects because um, Revit models especially are very prob problematic with 3D printers. It's far easier to use something that was modeled from scratch in Rhino or any proper 3D software than it is to go from Revit. So just word of advice, if you if you are designing for the purpose of 3D printing, I would not advise using Revit. But if you've already done the building in Revit, then you have to do that work of cleaning it up and also removing all the necessary spaces inside because you don't want to finish all your materials printing the spaces inside. Um, there are several other uses for 3D printing. Um, is used for demonstrations most commonly is used for creating models that are probably too fragile to be assembled so if you have to work with something else really fragile to work with tools it will probably be easier to 3d print it um, you can also use it to do all in one assembly of parts so if you have a model that is made of several parts and it's tricky to assemble i've seen people model it in a, um, in a way that when you print it, it, it works. Like the parts are printed together and it just works. This is for things that are a bit more mechanical in nature. Um, there are also 3D printed organs. I think there have been successfully 3D printed organs where they find a way to um, merge the 3D print with human tissue such that the people who need the organs don't reject it and it just works. And there's also concrete 3D printing for buildings and food printing. Food printing sounds hilarious, but a lot of people are actually using it to print tiny details on chocolate, as you can see, or um, chefs that are a bit more out there are using it to expand what they are able to present to their customers. Um, the largest 3D printed building so far is in Dubai. I think this is one of the biggest so far. There are several that have been successfully completed, but this is the biggest one. And um, they sort of used very little extra reinforcement. It's primarily to 3D prints. One of the things about 3D prints, because it goes layer by layer, are these lines that you can see, they're sort of like ribs. Um, it will take a great deal of finishing, I imagine, to cover them. Because even in objects, you sort of get those lines and a lot of designers don't like them. So I think that's one of the reasons why it's still not very popular as a method of building. So um, that's just one of the outcomes of 3D printing. And so finally, last but not least, virtual reality. Um, virtual reality is a technology that allows interacting with 3D computer simulated environments um, feel as though it were real whether that environment is a simulation of the real world or an imaginary world. This image incidentally is a reality capture that I did in Austria and it was rendered in 3D Max to look as glossy as it did. We liked the way the image came out um, so I just use it in that way but um, it was originally a photogrammetry model from several images taking over the course of two hours. Um, there are several software available for doing virtual reality. There's Unreal Engine, Unity, Enscape, Autodesk Live, Steam VR, Iris, Get360, and so on. And then there are even more hardware. There's so many VR hardware companies. I think one of the most popular ones right now is the Oculus um, Rift. And 
it is um, quite amazing how much VR has become more intuitive to a point where you do not feel as though you are holding a wand or holding something. You, you just imagine you're experiencing the space. So um, this is me when I was teaching at the University of Sheffield and we were using a HTC Vive accompanied with lighting and projections and, and projectors, sorry, and sensors. And this sort of helped the experience. So all these extra parts sort of help in how interactive the experience is. You're able to, the model you're walking through is able to know maybe when you're about to hit a wall or when you're about to move past a boundary or something and you can just sort of stop. So they, they help beyond the regular just VR headset that I think is more common where you just slot your phone in or the Oculus. These ones that come with a bit more gear, a bit more interactive. And I think the most interactive of them all is the cave. So the VR cave is an automatic virtual environment where projectors are directed to between three and six of the walls. Um, it's almost lifelike because there are several projectors, cameras, and sensors working together. And there's a motion capture system that records your position. So as you move through the space, the um, object reacts to you moving. I'm going to show a video demonstrating that shortly. Um, the computer is gener uh, rapidly generating images and it's based on the motion capture from all these other gear surrounding it. So um, this is an example of someone using the cave and you can sort of see the person isn't holding a wand or wearing gloves or anything like that, but you can sort of just see the object moving around the person because of the complexity of the cave. So I imagine in the future, this is where a lot of companies are going to be investing in. They will have caves where you can just walk around as though you were just walking around in real life and you wouldn't feel you were in a virtual environment. That's one of the interesting things about um, virtual reality. I think out of all the things I've talked about today, virtual reality is one where your presence is kind of... Sorry, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, we yeah, can hear you. Okay, yes, good. Yes. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Okay, so um, virtual reality is one where presence is very interesting. Presence is basically um, a concept describing the effect people have when they interact with something that is mediated by a computer or a computer-generated environment. And of all the mediums I've just described, I think virtual reality is one where your brain does not really know the difference between a VR world and the real world, if the simulation is good enough. The, the mind does not know. I've experienced that if just a few times where you feel sensations as though they were really happening. And you actually have to sort of remind yourself that it's a simulation. And that's why it's very useful for analyzing emotional impact of spaces on people. Um, I know in this part of the world, our designs are more commercial. We're not really thinking of emotional well-being as such. We're more thinking of, we're always thinking of like the economical impact and so on. So um, designing for emotional impact is not something that is popular, but our spaces are supposed to make people feel better. Healthcare spaces are supposed to make people um, heal faster and so on. So um, virtual reality is really, really interesting in how it's able to simulate that and measure it and test it out. Uh, one of the students' projects, which I highlighted here, he did a project which was basically to sensitize people to um, water pollution. So you can see that funny image of a fish wearing a VR headgear. He was just trying to illustrate the life of a fish on a day flowing through the stream. And by going to that experience, you're able to see directly the impact of your waste on a fish's, oh, sorry, a fish's everyday life. So in that way, you probably think twice the next time you want to toss Tupperware or plastic plate into the gutter because you've experienced what it's like to have to navigate through that and go through it. So um, people are using virtual reality more and more for those sorts of 
activism and promoting remote interactions. Um, this is one I have done personally. I did it for a site inspection. I was basically trying to demonstrate to my uh, management that they could view the site from the comfort of their offices. Um, the image is distorted because it's a 360 image that was captured with Gear, um, Samsung Gear 360. Um, if you go to the YouTube link here, you could possibly watch it in 360, but as it says right now, it's distorted because it's a PowerPoint. But in, in YouTube, on YouTube, for example, you could actually wear headgear and just go through this. You can hear the sound of sirens in the background and everything. So that's with virtual reality. Think of everything you can already do today and then imagine doing that in a virtual world. It saves everyone time, especially now that um, with the COVID-19 pandemic and everything, I think people are starting to see the importance of improving virtual technology because if we are unable to move, we should still be able to experience spaces or do virtual tourism or something because we don't know what caused us to not be able to travel as we're seeing today. Um, some more popular uses of VR include HSC training. So you want to simulate a very dangerous situation and know how your staff will react to it. Rather than putting their lives in danger, you can use virtual reality to do that. You can do remote site inspection like I've just talked about. Um, there's something quite interesting that people are testing out now, which is virtual reality designing. And it's not like you'll be in a VR world and then you are drawing as you normally would. It's going to change the way we design. Like I said earlier, these tools are a way to extend our imagination. So the way we even imagine right now is because of the tools we have been used to, pen and paper and so on. But imagine being able to build, disassemble, reassemble, while thinking, designing, testing, and all of that the way you think about design and the way your mind is able to imagine things will also change. So a lot of research is going into that virtual reality sketching and designing. And I think it's going to really change the way we work in the future. Um, there are also virtual tours. So if you can't afford to travel to any of the hot tourist spots, you could probably get a virtual tour. And trust me, with the right equipment, it feels just as good. <laughs> So that's something that is going to become more popular, especially after this pandemic, I'm very sure. Um, there's virtual reality education, trainings and simulations, behavioral therapy for people with dis um, mental or uh, emotional disorders. You can sort of simulate environments for them to um, get, to sort of get feedback of their behavior and maybe teach them how to work through their fears and so on. And then, there is also um, there is also virtual reality for um, simulating surgeries or even um, dentistry appointments. So I've seen a lot of people in the medical sector use it for practice. So typically, medical students will have to wait till a sick person comes in before they can practice. And if you're unfortunate, you'll be the person that a an in, a training medical doctor is practicing on, and that's not very nice. So with virtual reality, you can create problems for the students to keep practicing and perfecting their skills until they're able to deal with real patients. And I think that's good news for everyone. So everything else, to be honest, this is just the beginning. I don't think there's anything that we have in real life today that can't be simulated in a virtual world. Um, I think it's very exciting what we see in virtual reality in the coming um, years. And I would advise anyone who's interested in it to really dive in fully because a lot of things are going to revolve around that in the future. So these are just images showing how it's been used in construction, design and construction management. You can visualize your coordinated models in real time. You don't have to sort of struggle around Revit to see what is clashing with what. If you have a coordinated model, you can put it in a VR environment and actually see those connections as though the building has been built and it saves time in a lot of ways. In the future, you'll probably be able to edit the design while in that VR world. So 
there is a review, there's a mistake and you need to change immediately. You can do that in the VR world without leaving and it saves a whole lot of time in RFIs, change orders, getting the person in the office to now come and revise the model and send it back and so on. So um, that's one way it's been used. There is an award-winning film that um, VR has been used for in activism, um, highlighting the experiences of the Chibok girls and how it impacted their families. It's very um, amazing that a Nigerian did this and it won an award at Venice International Film Festival. Um, so many ways VR has been used. It's also used for child education by a company called EMC here in Lagos. They use it to teach children mathematics and so on. So the possibilities are endless. Um, I hope I haven't bored you too much. That is the end of the talk. So I will now take questions from anyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the time, Victoria. Um, during the course of the presentation, um, some questions were posted into the chat. So we'll be taking them. Uh, I met, um, Roots that what is the difference between reality capture and photogrammetry? Um, should I um, ask all the questions and then you treat them or we'll do them over? Okay, so for whether it's laser scanning or LiDAR or whatever it is, it's all reality capture. Sorry, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, so yeah, it's all reality capture and um, yeah, that's, it's like an umbrella that covers everything. I hope that answers the question. Okay, so Joy is also asked that uh, based on reality capture, could we print a 3D model? Could you 3D print a model? Yes, in fact, I think maybe it wasn't clear from that initial diagram, that was what I was trying to illustrate that from reality capture, you can start the process all over again. You can directly print a model. However, it would be messy because the reality capture comes in front of, sorry, it comes in form of points. It's a series of points clustered together. Um, so when it comes out as a model, it's not very smooth. Um, the technology hasn't evolved up to the point where you, you take your reality capture and you print it and it's perfect. So it will probably be better still to model it again um, as opposed to just printing directly. But yes, you can in fact print directly. It, it, the, the reality capture is a full 3D model. You can do anything you can do with a 3D model with it. I haven't tried rendering, but I'm pretty sure you could probably render it as well. Okay, okay, another, another question, question asked that that's from Ismaila. That how likely can you recommend Autodesk 3D Print Studio for printing? Autodesk 3D Print Studio. I have never used that. In fact, I think that's the first time I'm hearing of that, and I'm going to check it out because um, most of the time the software you use for 3D printing is the software for the printer. So every printer comes with its own recommended tool. They don't all like work well together. So if you have maybe a MakerBot, you would use the MakerBot desktop software for that and print from there. So unless you are using an Autodesk 3D printer, maybe, who knows, maybe it's, it's an easier way to um, work with Revit models in 3D printing. I'm actually going to go and check it out now that you mentioned it but I, I haven't used it before. I wouldn't advise you to print from, from there. Like I wouldn't advise you not to use the printer's proprietary software because you're probably better off using their software. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Um, Joy is also asked that Unreal Engine versus Autodesk Life, which one do you recommend for virtual reality? For virtual reality. Okay, um, that's a very interesting question. It depends on, I'd say it depends on what you're trying to do and also your own desire as a person to go into virtual reality. 
if you're working in an office as an architect and your task is to just send this model into VR so that our clients can see it, I would probably say use Autodesk Live because it works well with Revit and it gives you the basic functionality of VR. But if you're going to do something really technical, like have interactions, where you go close to the door, the door opens, when you touch a light switch, lights come on, and all that high level interactivity, then I'll definitely use Unreal Engine. Autodesk Live is not as robust. It's like comparing maybe SketchUp to 3D Max or something like that. That's, that's that kind of comparison. So it depends on what you're trying to get out of it. Okay, thank you. Now, choice again hacks that as much as I know, virtual mm. reality could be very useful on site for more effectivity in the building act. Yeah. So, which one of those technologies is actually ready for use in Africa for professionals at the time we are mm. speaking? This is a, that's a very, very deep question. Which one is ready for use in Africa? Ah. Uh, that question, that question is broader than the question. I'm sorry to sound that way. So before we can talk about using virtual reality on site, can the people on site even, first of all, maybe have power supply to power the virtual reality? Can they access iPads if they need to or whatever tablet to be able to get the files, to be able to connect to the VR um, software. There was one that was highlighted at last year's West African Digital Conference, um, a HP virtual reality gear. It comes like a school bag. So most of the ones I talked about, they're very heavy and they require plenty of connections. But this one, they've been able to do it such that you can charge it, wear it on your back and go anywhere. So, I'm guessing if there was a company that could afford to use that one, then they would use that one. But it's a thing of our priorities, first of all, in Africa. I think, to be very honest, there are several hurdles we will have to cross in Africa before anyone is willing to invest in virtual reality on site. I think any of these technologies can be applied in Africa. They weren't designed to be location specific. but to actually get it done, there are several steps. Actually even getting a proper BIM model that can now be used on site is one of the issues we're still dealing with. So yeah, any of them can be used in Africa. I hope I didn't mess up that question. It's just, it's very bold. Are you satisfied? Do you need more clarification? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Ismail Isifanos. Yeah. Um, I want to ask concerning maybe using a design software such as AutoCAD or 3ds Max. Yeah. How can someone um, link it with virtual reality? Because I sometimes find myself working maybe with, uh, within a large landscape of land or the sites like that. Is mm. there a kind of way someone can link it to virtual reality? Okay, you said AutoCAD and 3ds Max, right? Yeah. Okay, um, I would definitely recommend 3ds Max, 3ds Max, sorry, yeah. over AutoCAD if you're going to do virtual reality. Um, I know AutoCAD has 3D. I've never used it personally, but I know it has 3D. And if you can find a way to export that 3D. So the thing is, a lot of VR software, like Uni I've used Unity and Iris, so I can speak from experience for those two. You can just um, export your model into the software the way you would do exporting Revit to DWG or importing DWG to Revit. I hope, I hope you're following me. Yeah. yeah, so you can easily, it's, a, it's like a one-click thing. Um, I think most VR tools, I'm forgetting now, but they accept either FBX or OBJ files. Now, as far as you can export your model to one of those file formats, you can get it into 
the VR software. The main thing the VR software does is add interactivity. So if you are just having a model and you're just walking around it, it's not much different from orbiting in 3D Max or in Revit. But with the VR software, you're able to add interactions. When people do something, they get a reaction from the building. And I think that's what makes it more exciting for people to use than just regular models. Right. That's nice. Yeah. Any other questions? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Yes. My name is Ido. Um, I'm just joining you um, recently, so I missed out on some of the points that you've made. But okay. my request is that um. Hello? I could I, I catch some of the slides that you were explaining when I came in. So, but um, I think that was like two slides or there about. So I don't know okay. if you can share the, um, the complete file. Oh, um, I don't, I think this, the session will be recorded. I don't know, Moses, okay. can you clarify? Okay. Yes. Hello? Yeah. The recording will be made available. Okay, okay. I got the message now. Thank you very much. It's fine. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Are there other questions? You can omit your mic and ask your question. Okay. It's a question came into the chat box. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ameta. I joined in from Port Um okay. I have a question. Okay. You you mentioned that the streets for the three D print are often like a turn off. If I understand you very well. Yes. The um yes. those ribs. Yes. While I haven't, I cannot claim to have seen any of those before, but I'm just thinking as an architect, can't be yeah. seen as a plot. You consider it from the design, from the onset and the design that if it's going to come out this way, how can I harness it so that it's a plot in the final outcome of the, of the, of the work? Is, it, is that possible? Well, yes, to be very honest, um, I mean, Going back to traditional African architecture, ribs are what we do. Like we would find a plain model and find a way to put as many scars and ribs on it. So as Africans, I think it should even be something that we would enjoy playing with and also maybe even designing with. But, um, you know, modernism and post-colonialism and all of that make everything to sort of look a certain way these days. So it's, it's more of, it would be, it would have to be a personal effort. I don't think it will be mainstream. I don't, who knows, maybe in the future, people would actually prefer to have their buildings having ribs as a, a kind of prestige to show that they 3D printed it as these things tend to go. But um, yeah, it's very possible to put that as part of the design and even now play with it in a way that it becomes interesting. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Yes, I'm back again. Um, oh, okay. Um, for concerning the virtual reality, Maybe yes. is there like a place in Lagos where you can direct someone to maybe test models for what is working on? Yeah. Okay. So uh, for now, when it comes to virtual reality, for now, I don't know of any place. I know people who have tools that you could probably, if you are polite enough, ask and they could decide to share with you. Is he um, asking about where? He's asking about where, where he can, like he has a model to share in VR and a to, place. Um, work on. 
Okay, so um, I'm not aware of any set up uh, public center or like a business that's that I'm aware of individuals. In fact, I own a virtual reality self myself. So I'm aware of other individuals who are available. Yeah. Yeah, so okay. there are yeah, sorry, there are people who have virtual reality sets, but if you want to try out 3D printing, um, I know a place is called GE Garage. It's inside um Mansard Place in VI. You can write okay. it down. You can actually Google their address, GE Garage. They have lots of 3D printers. If you bring your own material, they will let you print for free, I think. But you have to bring your own 3D printing material. And there are people there who are tech enthusiasts who are probably willing to help. Um, right. It's open to the public, basically. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? So are there other questions? Yeah, um, if there are no other questions before uh, Moses does the roundup, I am probably available if you have more questions. There was some disruption while the presentation was going on. I'm sorry about that. But if you have anything which I mentioned which you'd like more explanations on, you could um, send a correspondence through BIM Africa to me or basically just get in touch with me, in, in, with me, sorry. I'm usually very available via LinkedIn. So you can send me a message and I would respond. Yeah. Okay. So um, since there are no que other questions, uh, the recording of the session will be made available for people who may want to go through it again. And I uh, would like to appreciate you all for joining this session today. Like we are all aware, it's uh, these are quite troubling times. We are advising that everybody stay at home and uh, keep learning, like we say. There will be a BIM talk next month. We are finalizing on speakers and we'll all be invited. So um, that will be the end of the session today. Thank you all for coming and we hope that you are staying safe. Thank you. So you can unmute your mic. You do very well, and then we end the meeting. All right, thank you. And uh, thank you to our facilitator for today. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>